G'day trendsetters, John with Gravel Cyclist. Uh, today I'm coming to you from Linsky Performance in beautiful Chattanooga, Tennessee, and uh, accompanying me today across the table is Mr. Mark Linsky. Greetings. So, uh, Mark, uh, tell me a little bit about Linsky uh, Performance. Your company's been around for about 10 years, but it has some other history, I understand. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, I'll try to give you what we would call the Reader's Digest version. Okay, the Cliff Notes version. Cliff Notes, that's maybe a better one. Um, you know, uh, our world of that we live in now began in the uh, mid-1960s okay. here in Chattanooga with my father starting a small machine shop. Okay. Um, at the time, Chattanooga was one of the, not, it was the ninth largest industrial center in the nation. And that was uh, due to, not necessarily, there was a lot of manufacturing going on in Chattanooga, but down in Huntsville, Alabama, we had uh, NASA, uh, Manchester, Tennessee had Arnold Air Force Base, the Air Force Development Center, Oak Ridge, Tennessee had nuclear going on and all these, and due to uh, what was what's called the Tennessee Valley Authority, it's a slight sort of pseudo pseudo government run power organization in the Tennessee River and dams and hydroelectric, um, we have a cornucopia of private industry around. Um, at the time, even textiles, chemical, etc. cetera. And um, so that's what he, his little machine shop was serving. So right out of the gate, it, it's not Joe's lawnmower repair. It was really sophisticated work albeit on a very small scale. Sure. So fast forward, let's fast forward to the mid 80s. Um, this pretty much, you know, I can, rem I can sit here right now and, and remember being seven and eight years old, dad's coming in working on the weekends, putting me up on a milk crate in front of a threading machine, cutting threads on bolts. I mean, I can, I can remember that right now. I can, I can smell the cutting oils. At years the, of age, nice. Yeah, uh, child labor. Child labor. Have, the child labor oils were, you know, <laughs> minimal then. Nice. And um, yeah, I was, you know, it's two or three cents a day. Hey. Oh yeah. Um, why not? Yeah. Why not? <laughs> um, so this is really all. I've done this, and the rest for the rest of my family. This is pretty much all we've done. I, I'll, I turn sixty later this year, so I've been doing it quite a while. Very nice. Um, so fast forward to the mid '80s. The company, his company's grown, and we expanded not just into machining, but machining and welding. And we became what you would call exotic metals specialists. Now, in that world, exotic, you know, exotic metals is not precious metals, it's not gold, silver, no. etc. It's it's generally non-ferrous alloys. What does that mean? Stainless, aluminum, niobium, tantalum, nickel-based all alloys, titanium, etc. Um, so the mid 80s roll around, my younger brother David, we, we were all runners of a sort. Well, he had uh, serious knee issues, had to quit running, took up cycling, got in the local racing scene. This is like 84. Okay. And then about, after about a year and a half, started out with a, sh uh, a Schwinn Latour. Oh, very nice. It was his first bike. Okay. And then he graduated to a Cannondale. Okay. Back when Cannondales were aluminum and the, oh, the, the small ones. tubes looked like beer cans. Yes, yes. And uh, and then he's like, you know, I'm going to make my, I want to build my own frame. This is what we do. We make things, okay. And I'm going to make it out of titanium. I've got some over in the rack. Oh. Uh, so the next thing you know, uh, and I can, I can again, I can sit there and I remember he bought himself a little how to make a bicycle frame book. A little brownish thing. I don't know if he's even still gotten it. And we were standing out in the machine shop area at the time, and we're going through it and we're going, oh, they call that a chain stay. Well, that makes sense. It's near the chain. And that, though, they call those, I, we, this was our vocabulary at the beginning. <laughs> and um, so he measuring his old frame, kind of, sort of, maybe, and he whips out his next frame. And uh, it's probably the only 62 centimeter frame ever created that had about two inches of toe clip overlap. <laughs> we learned what toe clip overlap was really quick. <laughs> true, true custom. After you're laying in the parking lot going, what just happened? <laughs> so, um, so, so in 1986, the decision was made, hey, let's, let's 
give this, this is interesting. Because hmm. uh, David had friends, will you make me one, will you make me one? So in 1986, uh, we share a booth with some energy company, a ten, little 10 by 10 out at the Long Beach Bike Show, okay. which is the predecessor of Interbike. Mm -hmm. um, David goes out there, um, gets some interest. Next thing you know, we've got a couple magazine articles going. Next thing you know, the phone's ringing. And we're like, oh, what do we do now? Because yeah. uh, it was still a weekend after hours kind of thing. So by 1989, we said, you know what, we need to make a serious go of this. Um, we actually did a small addition to the building. We created the bicycle shop area. Okay. Uh, put about six employees in there. And by 1996, we stepped away from all other industrial work and committed ourselves 100% to cycling. Wow. Wow. Um, we never were marketing the company for say, and the company, the name became Lightspeed. Sure. And uh, on a, how do we, you know, this is always a funny story because you hear, oh, think tank this, market analysis that. And the way we came up with Lightspeed, we're sitting in my office one day, it's lunchtime, we're kind of munching on our sandwiches. And myself and Teresa, my sister and David are in there, and we're like, well, what are we gonna call it? What are they and uh, Teresa's like, well, you know, it's light, 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 light speed. And David's like, and we'll spell it like the beer. <laughs> Done. Done. Yeah, brilliant. Works for us. Yeah. <laughs> so there's our think tank for uh, where the name came from. In 19, and so titanium did what carbon did later on. It just became overnight. Boom. I remember it. It, the, yeah, it, it was it, the cool it, thing. It was the for, thing to have in the 90s. Whether it, whether it, whether it, whether it did or didn't it just it had that it had a unrelenting momentum oh, yeah. Yeah. and at that time there was really only two places in the world to get it us and Merlin mm. <clears throat> and um, Merlin uh, had no interest in doing you know they want they were bit all about Merlin we're just gonna do Merlin etc and uh, which is fine it's just whatever you want to do and but suddenly, the, every bike brand on the planet going, oh, we need titanium bikes. What are we going to do? And there was no, you, at that point in time, there was no Taiwanese or Asian sourcing available. Sure. Um, and so we started getting phone calls. And being manufacturing based and oriented in, in a heritage, our attitude was, well, why not? Better to have a little bit of something than a whole lot of nothing. Um, so really, in the first three or four years of business, 80% of our volume was for other brands. Wow. I think by 1993 was the biggest year we built for, I believe, 24 different brands that year. Wow. Not in, plus our own. Wow. wow. Now, the exciting thing about that is, let's, let's, let's back up a minute to our, our, our wonderful knowledge of bikes and backgrounds and having to get a book to understand what the hell a chain stay is. We're suddenly sitting across from the table from some of the world's most renowned bike designers and bike brands, and we're pretty good listeners. Sure. So that's how we learned bikes. Gotcha. You know, we I, we didn't grow up and have a race. And oh, I used to pro race this and, and downhill that. No, we learned we're we learned bikes that way. Right. And pretty good education. Sure. You know, you're sitting across the table from you know everything from. John Tomac to Erio Tomasini to the DeRosa family to Eddie Merckx, you know, I, I, just a few uh, pretty good household names. Pretty good background. Yeah, pretty later good. on, later on, you know, Lance Armstrong. Oh, they learned how to make a little hidden pockets in the bike there in that area. Nice, nice. That's a joke. He's a pretty well known cyclist. Yeah, he, yeah, fairly well. He's, he's we won a few things. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's all going on. Then in 1999, the company was never marketed for sale. Mm. Um, but word got, you know, and companies wanting to grow, expand, you know, and, and all their market research, and any company was interested in the bike industry, well, what's, what's, it, what's right now, what's the brand at the top of the pyramid? And right. it was us. Right. And eventually we got an offer that we looked at each other and we said, guys, we, this is the right, this is the smart thing to do. 
then we did it and we, we sold the company. Um, the rest of the family, they stayed on for a, a year or so. Um, I ended up staying with them for about five years. Okay. This was, this was 99. Transitory think, period think, sort of thing. Well, it didn't intend that to be for me, but it, quite frankly, it was a, it was a double-edged sword for me personally. Um, you know, being the only job I'd really ever had, suddenly be ex being exposed to an entirely different corporate environment. Mm. Um, I, I got a I got an education in business that I couldn't have gotten at Harvard. Sure. Um, so that was a very good thing for me. Uh, the challenging side was, it ain't me. <laughs> and uh, you know, you get to a point where you're living life on an airplane, looking at spreadsheets, worrying about finance ratios. And well, there's a lot of people that enjoy that. Sure, I mean, that's what they do. Yeah, not um, my bag. But it just really, it didn't fit me. It didn't fit my life. And in the end, uh, it, not even about my life. I wasn't doing a good job for the company either. Sure. And so, uh, in 2005, I said, "Okay, guys, I need to part company." Uh, and then, um, in within months after that, my mother's on the phone going, "So, what are you going to do?" What are you going to do? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> and uh, that Thanksgiving, we're all the families together, and we kind of said, okay, let's let's come back together. And, you know, we, we as a family, we, we know how to work with each other, which is a challenge in itself. Mm. Running a family business oh. is, sure. is has its own set of unique challenges. Um, we said, okay, let's do. And we didn't immediately say bikes. We said, well, what do we enjoy most? creating things, making things, manufacturing. So I went to work and started to do some thoughts, etc. But it did come full circle. Okay. The name was, we were still well known in bikes. <clears throat> I had still, even though the rest of the family hadn't necessarily been, I was still intimately in touch with the marketplace and knew what was going on, trends, etc. And so we said, yeah, this was fall of 2005. And so in January of 2006, um, rented a, rented a building started David started buying equipment I mean we had nothing to start yeah. you know it's not like we had stuff stored in the warehouse start off again, yeah. um, and I didn't I couldn't officially join them till August of the, that year because I had a 12 month non-compete that I had to wait out sure um, but by April they became functional took their first order and um, been off to the races since then. 